talked about um, how our body defends us. What's some of our lines of defense? What's our number one line of defense? Or our first line of defense, not number one. Your skin, and your skin does what? It shields, it protects things from getting in. What's another line of defense? Tears. tears. What do tears do? It washes them out. Okay, give me another line. Mucus, what does that do? Huh? Traps germs. Okay, give me something else, Wiggins. Where are they? In your throat, and they do what? Very good. And you got something else for me? Stomach acid is also another line of defense that kills the bacteria. But our once those things get into our body, then what's our line of defense? You got something for me? Once it gets into our body, and what's in our immune system, Maggie? White blood cells. White blood cells, or blood in general. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is human blood. And we're going to discuss human blood, and you're going to be taking notes on the human blood. And you have some trivial facts about human blood to help you understand what it is that our blood does for us. So while we're um, discussing, you're going to be jotting some things down on your note sheet, but we're first going to begin by allowing um, Tim and Moby to speak to us uh, first about human blood. And they're going to give us some information that you may be able, may be able to help you fill in your notes. So. My older brother said that doctors come to his school and take people's blood. Is this true? Why do the doctors need blood? From Benny. Don't worry, Benny. Nobody will force you to give blood. Doctors do need blood for operations, and that's why people donate it. Why do people need blood in the first place? Keep your shirt on and we'll tell you. Blood is your body's liquid messenger. Hello. It takes oxygen and nutrients to every cell in the body. Oh, well, blood is made mostly inside our bones in a tissue called bone marrow. It circulates through the lungs and other parts of your body thanks to the pumping action of your heart. From the heart, blood gets pumped to the lungs where it picks up oxygen and then travels to tissues at the far reaches of the body. The blood drops off oxygen for the tissues to use and then circulates back to the heart. Blood may look like some red, sticky stuff, but it's actually made up of lots of different kinds of substances. First, it's got cells. The most common is the erythrocyte, or red blood cell. See, each of those little donut-shaped thingies is a red blood cell. They're red now because they're full of oxygen. Red blood cells contain a protein called hemoglobin. Oxygen attaches to your hemoglobin when your blood passes through your lungs. White blood cells, or leukocytes, keep from getting sick. They're bigger than red blood cells, and there aren't as many. Some white blood cells actually surround invading germs and eat them. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty crummy snack to me, too. No, but check this out. One drop of blood contains somewhere around 50 million red blood cells, 100,000 white blood cells, and 2.5 million platelets. Oh, right. Platelets are your blood's built-in safety net. When you get a cut, they help your blood to harden or clot. That way, you don't bleed to death from one measly paper cut. Blood also contains something called blood plasma. Actually, plasma is the biggest component of blood overall. It's a clear but slightly yellow substance that's made almost completely of water. It also has some important chemicals and proteins in it, things like antibodies to fight infection, hormones that regulate your body, and electrolytes, which keep your body properly hydrated. Oh yeah, people have different blood types. You can check out our blood types movie to learn more about them. You should ask your parents about your blood type in case you already need to tell a doctor. So don't be scared by your brother's antics, Benny. Giving blood is a great way to save lives. The average adult's body contains about 10 pints of blood in all, and children have less. So you're not allowed to donate any more than a pint at a time. One pint alone is enough to make some people feel really dizzy. Yeah, like that. All right, so how much blood in the, is in the human body? And the average adult, 
how many pints of blood is in an average adult? Okay, 10 pints of blood are an average adult. To put that into a comparison for you, that would be like drinking what? Not a lot. How, like, in comparison, what are the things that you drink that are in pints? You do not. What about in the cafeteria? You don't drink that. Those are half pints, so that means you would put two of those together. That means you would have to drink how many of those? 20 of those milk cartons in the cafeteria to allow to fill the amount of blood that you have in your body. Put your hand down for one second. Like these are the Nest Quicks. The Nest Quicks come in pints. 16 ounces is one pint. So that would be how many cups is 16 ounce? Two cups. Eight ounces is one cup. That means you would have to drink how many cups of water? 20. 20 cups of water would actually fill up the amount of blood that you have in your body. Is that a lot? Yeah. I don't know. Is that a lot, though? No, that's not really a lot, which means how much water, the most of our body is what? Water. How many liters is that, though? It's five liters. Five liters would be like the... Uh, bottles of soda that you go and buy from the store. That's about how much we have. Yes. Do you know how much blood you have to leave before the DX is Uh no I don't, but I do know that you only can donate one pint of blood, which would be two of those cartons from the cafeteria, and then you have to let your body thirty days let your body recuperate before you can donate again. So I'm thinking anything more than a pint, that's when you're gonna start to get really sick because even a pint you get kind of dizzy. All right. Your blood is your transporting fluid, meaning it does what? What stuff is it transporting? And nutrients, which we're going to call vital substances. Vital substances are substances that are very important. Oxygen and nutrients are important. They're vital substances. Thank you, I appreciate it. Any questions about that? Okay. Where is human blood made? It's in a soft tissue within the bone called the bone marrow. Now the bone marrow is within the bone, we know that. And if anyone ever um, donates bone marrow, which people do because sometimes people need don bone marrow transplant, um, they actually go in, everybody touch the back of your hip here. They go into the back of your hip there. You feel how hard your hip bone is right there? A long needle like that is pushed into your hip into the bone it kind of fractures the bone a little bit in there and they suck out the bone marrow the painful part is the part that they break part of your bone and just a little bit but it's enough to hurt um how many of you watch good morning america robin yes she had a bone marrow transplant so not only did her sister she donated this bone marrow to her actually went inside there to get the bone marrow out, which was painful for them, and then donated it to her, which was a painful already process for her because she had cancer. Do you know there's the same blood type as them? Like yes, and we're going to talk about that. Yes, so luckily her sisters were a match, and she is living and well. All right, let's move on uh, from here. We know that one drop of blood equals certain things. When I say one drop of blood, I mean like if you just gave yourself a small paper cut, or you pricked yourself with a needle from sewing. How many of you have done any of those things? So you've all lost a drop of blood. In a drop of blood, it, it contains platelets. How many platelets are in a drop of blood? 2.5 million platelets on that little, little drop of blood. That's not all that's in there. It also contains red blood cells. How many uh, red blood cells are in that little drop, Ayana? 50 million, 50. That little drop of blood also contains white blood cells. What, how many white blood cells, um, James? 100,000 white blood cells. In that little drop of blood, you have all of that stuff going on in there. What is your human blood made up of? It's made up of something called erythrocytes. What are erythrocytes? Gosh, you have a lot of voices back there, Grace. Red blood cells. Erythro means? Red. red. 
site cell. So these are your red cells, the red blood cell. It's also made up of leukocytes. Okay. White blood cells. Leuco means site means cell. You also have thrombocytes. Thrombocytes mean bursting. And in the video for Tim and Moby, these were the ones that looked like they had crazy hair going on. So they're like bursting cells. And these are considered your platelets. And then your cells are also made up of a liquidy fluid, flowing like stuff. Water. Plasma. Water. Right. Now we're going to break down each of these in your notes and discuss each of them. And we're going to start off with um, the things, all of these things actually are what your blood is made up of and how they protect your blood. And we're going to start off with platelets, which would be your thrombocytes. Your platelets are your safety net, and they're going to help your blood to do what? Clot. Clot. What is clotting? Right, when it sticks together. Where do you want your blood to clot? When you get a cut, and it's going to clot to form a what? A scab. A scab is your natural um, type of what? Band-aid. You put a band-aid on it, you're covering up, but your blood will actually form a natural Band-Aid for you. So platelets are your blood safety net, which gives you that Band-Aid. I'm so blind to remember I took, took my finger and did a cut for you for that. You took a while for your blood to clot. And if you sit with it or if you kept it moist, then that also stops it from clotting and your hands stay very moist. All right. Platelets are also the clotting factors in the plasma that stick together in a process called coagulation seal the wound and prevent a loss of blood. So where are your platelets located? In the blood. Where in the blood? In the plasma. It tells you right here, clotting factors in the plasma. Your platelets are the ones that are going to come to rescue, jump together, and they're going to stick together in the form called coagulation. Co means together. together. Uh, agglutination comes from the word agglutinate. What word do you hear in agglutinate? Glue. glue. What does glue mean? Stick together. stick together. And that's what agglutinate means, stick together. Um, sticking. Agglutinate means sticking. Coagulate means sticking together. together. So your cells are going to stick together to form this uh, clot and so that you can have a scab on it. All right. Moving on now to plasma. Plasma is the yellowish liquid portion of your blood. It contains your electrolytes. It also contains your nutrients and vitamins that should all be on one line. Electrolytes are good for what? Hydration. Hydration, yes. It's also in your Gatorade. Nutrients and vitamins we know are very good for us. We need those types of things for energy. Your hormones, things like your ADH, your antidiuretic hormone, which regulates the amount of liquids that stay in your body. Um, also your clotting factors. What are your clotting factors? Platelets. Platelets. Good. It also contains your proteins used to fight infections. And they help to regulate your body temperature. The regulation of body temperature is conducted from your hormones. Your hypothalamus is a gland that helps to regulate your body temperature. Questions? We're good? Can I move? Okay. Next we're going to talk about our white blood cells. Now your white blood cells are also known as? Leukocytes. Leuco means? White. Very good. These are your disease fighters. These are the ones that go to combat. They put on that helmet and they go to combat when someone's messing with you. They're your body. Here's what do you say to you? You know, talk to you like that. What? What? I'll take care of them. Let me at them. Let me at them. I'll get them. Let me at them. That's the white blood cell. And they're there and they're tough and they're going to fight right off everything that comes into contact with your body. Where are they located? Blood. Where in the blood? Use your notes that I've just given you. Information. How do you know they're in the plasma? Nope, I didn't tell you. What does it say about the plasma? Yes. 
proteins that help fight infection, so they're yeah. definitely in the plasma. And they're going to defend us against foreign substances. Foreign substances could be bacteria, they could be viruses, foreign substances can be incompatible blood. You got a blood transfusion and it was your blood did not like that blood, it didn't match, that's foreign, it's going to fight it off. talk about that. What was that question? What type of cell is a white blood cell? No, nope. what type of cell is it? We talked about two major types of cells. Oh. Right. Clayton. It, you know, white blood cell is not a prokaryotic cell. It's a eukaryotic cell because where are they located? In animal cells. In the they're located in animals. So they're eukaryotic cells, which means they have a what? They have a nucleus, for sure. They all, we're about to talk about that. Let's discuss some diseases that affect the white blood cells. You don't need to write anything. Let's name that disease. This is a picture of this particular disease. This is a form of cancer in which the bone marrow makes too many white blood cells. Leukemia. Leuko means white. So we have too many white blood cells. That would be leukemia. Let's look at some types of white blood cells. This particular white blood cell, if you remember from yesterday's lesson, this particular white blood cell produces antibodies. Lymphocytes, thank you for raising your hand. I really appreciate that. This will be your lymphocyte. Lymph in Greek means watery or clear. Cyte means? Cell. So these are your watery, cells. watery clear cells. Another type of white blood cell is one that engulfs, eats, and destroys foreign substances. Andrew? Phagocytes. And in Greek, phago means eat. eat. Are these the cells um, that get eaten? No. These are your eater cells. Yes. Any well, when you have an overgrowth of cells, it's what? It's cancer. You have an overgrowth, meaning you produce too many. It's not a matching like your DNA. An overgrowth of cells produces a problem. A mo is an overgrowth of cells. And what you're going to see why a little bit later why that is why that proposes a, to be a problem. All right, good question. All right, let's look at white blood, what white blood cells are responsible for. Right now, you're not writing anything. You're just going to kind of go through a review and listen. But white blood cells are resp are the major component responsible for our immune response system. What do I mean when I say immune response? Uh, Jalissa, what's immune response mean? How what does what? How what fights off diseases? How your immune system fights off diseases or responds to its outside environment. Now as review, yesterday we talked about antibodies being produced by your white blood cells. This is the first step of the immune response. Which white blood cells produces those antibodies? Yes, lymphocytes are going to reproduce them. Don't write anything yet. An example of a lymphocyte would be a T cell. All T cells are lymphocytes, but not all lymphocytes are T cells. There's other types of lymphocytes, okay? The next thing is your antibodies are going to recognize and attach and clump to the foreign substance. This clumping here, unlike the clumping where your cells clump together, that's a coagulation. Here, when they're clumping to foreign substances, that's called agglutination. So your antibodies are going to agglutinate or glue to foreign substances. When they do, when they agglutinate to these foreign substances, that gluing to them or handcuffing them signifies what? That they're, that they're a bad thing. What comes along? The white, another white blood cell will recognize the fact that this bad guy is handcuffed. These are called phagocytes. 
Once the phagocytes recognize it, then what happens? They eat it and they destroy it. So let me give you a scenario how this would happen in real life that you can relate to this. Uh, someone's breaking into a house. Police are happening to drive by. What happens? They notice what? That they're breaking the law. So they capture that criminal and they do what? They put him in handcuffs. That would be your antibody. Uh, I'm sorry, let me say this. The police, the fact that the police officers are patrolling the area, those are your antibodies being produced. They're patrolling. They're looking to make sure everything is okay. They recognize something's not okay. I got a criminal breaking in the house, so they're going to attach that criminal with handcuffs. That's the group nation. Then they take them back to the police station. They sit them down in the area. Everyone knows that that's a criminal lie because he has handcuffs on it. So the captain and everyone else will notify, notice that that's a criminal. That's your father site recognizing the fact that it's a criminal. It's a group native. That person is convicted of the crime. What happens to them? They go to jail. Their life is over as they know it, correct? Therefore, father sites engulf it, eat it, and kill that foreign substance. That foreign substance's life is over as it knows it. All right, let's now you do the immune response. On your paper, you have four small square bullets. I need you to number those one, two, three, and four. If they're already numbered, then you don't need to number them. Now, these wording that's going to pop up here is not the exact wording of yours, so make sure you put it in correctly. Antibodies are produced by white blood cells. What are those white blood cells? Lymphocytes. So your lymphocytes produce antibodies. The next step, antibodies do what to foreign substances? Before they attach, they have to recognize. Your antibodies are going to recognize the foreign substance. Okay, that was the bad guy. Foreign substances can be bacteria, um, incompatible blood, viruses, and anything else that gets in the body that doesn't belong there. Even um, when you have body parts that are um, donated, like if you have a transferred, uh, trans, um, transplanted liver or a transplanted heart, anything like that, that's, your body could say, oh, this is foreign, and go and start rejecting it. The bad part about it as well is sometimes your body recognizes itself to be a foreign substance which would be an autoimmune disease, where your body says, uh, you don't belong here, and it starts to fight itself, and it's like, I do belong here. That's a difficult thing. Yes. Yep, and we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. Let me get through this, and we're going to go back to that. All right. Then the third part of the immune response system, again, your antibodies attach and to the clump and foreign substance by the process called agglutination. agglutination. So they recognize it and attach to it. Once they do that, another white blood cell recognizes the agglutinated substance, engulfs, eats, and destroys. What's that other white blood cell? Everyone. Phagocyte. Now you have the steps and four steps there. Here's diagrams below here where you are going to put these diagrams in order according to the immune response system. Take a moment and draw in the correct order. I don't have to tell you which pictures belong to one another. You should be able to figure it out based on the four steps that you have and put them in the chronological order from beginning to end representing the immune response. Go ahead and do that now. first in the immune response? 
Say louder. Which white blood cell produce the antibody? Huh? Lymphocytes. So the first picture that you had should have looked like this. How many of you got that part right? That represents the producing of antibodies. Then what happens next? Huh? They recognize foreign substances and what do they do to them? Agglutinate. Good. So your antibodies are going to recognize the foreign substance and they agglutinate to them and then what happens? Okay, let me say this. What do you notice between the antibody um, and the foreign substance? Okay, they match like a, like a puzzle. Antibodies are very specific and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. You have another white blood cell that recognizes the fact that an antibody has agglutinated to a foreign substance. Once it recognizes it, then what? Once it recognizes the agglutinated substance, then what happens? It what? Eats it and destroys it. Now, like Cade mentioned, the antibodies are very specific or matched to the foreign substance. They're very specific and diverse. Your body is going to produce their antibodies only for certain diseases. You don't produce an antibody for chicken pox, and then that same antibody protects you against the flu. It just doesn't happen. It would be cool. This is the reason why when you get a certain disease, you normally don't, do not get that disease again because you have antibodies for that disease. But when you get the flu, you can get it again. Why? There's different types of flu, so you do not have the antibody. That's like that the virus coming to your party. You're saying you're not wanted here. He goes home. He disguises himself, comes back, gets in the party. Next thing you know, you know that virus ruined the party. You put a picture up of that virus with the yellow hat on and the big yellow coat. The next time you have a party, he comes back with the blue hat on and the big blue coat. And you're like, oh, you're different. Come on in. Okay? Any questions for this? Does everyone have this? Okay, I'll give you a moment. talk about red blood cells and why this is up there I have no idea maybe because cytoplasm is going to appear red because of what's known as hemoglobin hemoglobin contains um, oxygen your red blood cells we know are called your what type of sites um, erythrocytes not only is it red because of hemoglobin it's also red because of something called iron Iron is a protein that is in hemoglobin, and it's also your transporter of oxygen. And that should be a subscript of two. Somewhere along the line, it got mixed up on the PowerPoint. So why is the cytoplasm, the liquid inside of a red blood cell, pure red? Hemoglobin and iron. Your red blood cells carry this vital substance through the body. What is it? Oxygen. What type of cell is your red blood cell? Eukaryotic. Eukaryotic. So it should have a blood nucleus, blood. but it doesn't. Throughout the process of the maturity of red blood cells, they got a little immature and they said, I don't need you anymore. I don't need a brain. I don't want you to get out of here and move. And they're kind of like teenagers and they got rid of their brain and they thought they knew everything. They did. Is that true? Yeah. Yes? Because they Job. You believe me? <laughs> no. Actually, that is what happened. The red blood cells did start off with the nucleus, but as the red blood cells matured, meaning they grow to be in the full-blown red blood cells, they lose the nucleus. It is a necessary process for them to lose the nucleus, and they're the only eukaryotic cell that does not have a nucleus. The reason why they don't have a nucleus, or the factor that they don't have a nucleus, allows them to do certain things for our bodies that we should be very grateful for. It allows them to have more space for our hemoglobin. Why do we want more space for our hemoglobin? Because our hemoglobin contains oxygen, and we need oxygen. Yeah. So this is a wonderful thing. 
In addition to not having a nucleus, it gives it a very unusual shape. We know for math, when things have an unusual shape, what ratio? More surface area to volume ratio. This is the unusual shape. Kind of looks like an inner tube with the bottom. It gives it the increased surface area to volume ratio, allowing it to facilitate what through our body? Oxygen. So it's supposed to have a nucleus. Thank goodness it got rid of it so that it can do these things. In addition to that, that unusual shape allows it to flow through narrow capillaries. Our blood has to flow through our capillaries. It has an unusual shape, so it gives it the ability to do that. I don't know. It's not shaped like that. <laughs> I don't know. If you look at this picture here, number one, that's like looking at the red blood cell face on, where you have like looking at the inner tube. If you look at picture number two, it's like looking at it from its side. It gives it that skinny, thin type shape, which allows it to flow through this blue looking capillary here, which is very good because we need our blood to flow through our body so we can have oxygen diffused. All right. Any questions thus far? So let's play name that disease for the red blood cell. Let's talk about diseases that actually affect our red blood cells. This particular disease, it occurs when the blood does not have enough hemoglobin. It's treated by taking in more iron because iron makes up hemoglobin. Brian, this is anemia. You have a lack of iron. Hmm? No, you're not writing this. Another disease, this is a genetic disease. Red blood cells become this type of shape, like a sickle. That's that type of um, weapon that is curved. You can shed at somebody. Yeah, you can use it for cutting off weeds. Um, it can't carry, you can't carry much oxygen with this type of disease. Kiara? This would be sickle cell anemia. You have a odd shaped um, red blood cell. Yes? Because they're not the same shape, can they get like stuck on stuff? Like not float through the cap? No, they would still flow, but they can't carry as much oxygen. The reason why they can't carry as much oxygen, they're not a full cell. Yeah. So they won't get stuck because it's still a flat-like cell. No, you still have about, it says about, it's not the exact amount, but you still have the same amount, it's just the shape of the cell. The only thing that's changing is the shape of the cell. It's like split in half almost, yeah. Mm, possibly. You'll figure that out later. Uh, are all of the blood cells that No, only some of them. Yeah. Good question. All right. Another disease that affects the red blood cells. This disease attacks the red blood cells, causes high fevers. Anybody know yet? If you have sickle cell shaped red blood cells, you cannot get this disease because it affects the full red blood cells. This is from a mosquito and it is malaria. All right, more about red blood cells. They contain a protein on the surface. So not only do they contain protein inside of them being hemoglobin, they also contain a certain protein that's on the surface. These would be A or B proteins. These proteins are called antigens. Some only have an A antigen. Some people only have B antigens on their red blood cells. Some people have both A and B antigens on their red blood cells. And some do not have any of them. Is that a disease? 
Nope. Having this type of information, knowing about the antigens that are on our blood, what are we talking about, Maggie? These are your blood types that we're discussing. The information that's going to pop up here, you have to decipher what it is that, you're be, that you'll be putting on your notes, but I'm going to go through all of it. Your blood type is established before you are born by specific what's that you inherit from your parents. These are genes that you inherit from your parents. You inherit one gene from whom and whom? One from your mom and one from your dad. We learned this already. These genes determine your blood type by causing proteins called agglutinogens. They're going to exist on the surface of your red blood cells. Yes. When is it established? Yes, at birth time. That's when it's established. Let's take a look about information about blood types before we move on. Hey, Moby, what's my blood type? Oh, come on, don't you have some special device to measure my blood type? Dear Tim and Moby, what are blood types and why are they important? From Matthew and Nathan. Well, people sometimes get a blood transfusion, a transfer of lots of blood from one person to another. That's usually done after an injury or to treat a certain disease. It's really important for doctors to know what your blood type is, so if you ever need a transfusion, they can match it to the blood type of a donor. Uh, I, I guess my doctor never told me mine. Anyway, there are two main parts to every person's blood type the blood group, and the RH factor. Well, normally your body wants to keep in what's familiar and keep out invading stuff to protect itself. So usually, if you share the same blood type as a donor, everything's fine. But if you have different blood types, then hemolysis, the destruction of red blood cells, can occur. Hemolysis can cause serious kidney damage, or even death. So to prevent this, blood is classified into one of four blood groups in the ABO blood system. The groups are based on two kinds of markers in your blood. Antigens, substances that cause immune responses, and antibodies, proteins that fight off invading substances. These are the four blood types. Group A blood has A antigens and anti-B antibodies. That means that A blood carries antibodies against B blood. So if you have group A blood, and you get a blood transfusion from someone with group B blood, you'll have an allergic reaction. Group B blood has B antigen and anti-A antibodies. People in this group can't receive group A blood. Group AB blood has both A and B antigens on the red cells and no particular blood antibodies. So people with AB blood can get blood from any other group, but they can't donate to any other group. Group O blood has no A or B antigens, but both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. That means that people with O blood can only get transfusions from other people with O blood. And since there is no antibody against O blood, people with O blood can donate to anyone. They're called universal donors. Well, the second part of a person's blood type is their RH factor. RH stands for rhesus, and it's called that because it was first observed in rhesus monkeys. The RH factor is another antigen that appears on the surface of some red blood cells. If you've got it, you're RH positive, and without it, you're RH negative. You can tell whether you're positive or negative by looking for a positive or negative sign next to your blood group. It can sometimes be okay if a person gets blood with a different RH factor than they have, but it is often dangerous, especially for women who are at or below childbearing age since it can harm the development of a fetus. Well, blood types are genetically determined by your parents, so they don't occur at the same rate in all populations. In the United States, O positive is the most common blood type. 38% of people have it. AB negative is the least common. It's found in only 1% of all Americans. But blood types occur in different percentages, in different ethnic groups, and parts of the world. Other blood systems are used in different countries, but they're a lot less common. 
Well, hey, what do you know? I'm very positive. What do you think Moby is? Happy. All right, so now that we have that information about blood types, let's go ahead and continue our notes here. Not writing anything yet, just to give you a little bit of information. There are three alleys that, um, or genes for a blood type. There's either A, B, or O. That means your parents have one of each of them. I'm mean, sorry, one of them. Uh, there's only three types that you can have. That makes sense. There's only three genes available in the entire world. Got that? Got that. So, since we have two genes, we get one from our mom and one from our dad, there are six possible um, types of genes that we can have. So, for instance, if your mom has the A antigen and your dad has an A antigen, that's going to give you the two genes of AA, correct? If your mom has the A antigen and your dad has no antigen, that's going to give you the combination of A, O, which would give you what type of blood type? A, just A. Because A is, well, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. A is the dominant one there, and if you have A antigen, so you are type A. Remember what they talked about in the video. That means you have the antigen sticking off of your blood. You have the A antigen. If your father has the B antigen and your mother has the B antigen, then you're going to get BB, which means your blood type is going to be B. Just have one letter for it. If neither of your parents have any of the antigen, you got none from mom and none from dad, then your blood type is going to be O. The O here means none. It's like a zero. If mom has A antigens and dad has A antigens, this is the only time that it blends together and you end up with A, B. A and B, I mean. Then you end up with A, B. Now, there are four main types of blood. Four blood types, I should say. One would be type A, type B, type O, and type A, B. Yes. Why is O the most Stay there. We'll talk about it in just a second. Blood type compatibility is based on how your immune system responds. If your immune system doesn't attack, then it's compatible. If your immune system attacks, it's not compatible. Questions about that so far? Yes. That's your immune system response. Your antigens and your antibodies aren't your antibodies part of your immune system? Yeah. There you go. For example, these are two pictures of two different examples. If your blood mixes or blends, it's compatible. In example one on the left picture, those are two bloods being put together. They're mixing for the most part, they're compatible. On the right, you have two bloods that have been put together. You notice no difference between those two bloods, do you? They've mixed, compatible, good transfusion. Just the type of blood that was there. On the flip side, if your blood clumps, also known as not a coagulation. Coagulation is when blood clumps together with itself. This is the glutination. Then it's not compatible. Notice here you have a separation between the two, like oil and water on picture number one. That's two bloods coming together, actually forming a separation in their mixture. We look at the second example on the right. Two bloods coming together, there's a separation like oil and water. This is also called hemolysis. What was hemolysis again? What did you say? Hemo means blood. Lysis means splitting it. So this is destroying of blood, like the mention in Tim and Moby. If a blood comes in that your blood doesn't like, it's going to destroy it. Hemolysis, you might want to know that, yes. That will be like in a blood transfusion. I'm giving you an example of what a blood transfusion would look like. Not putting it together, cutting each other, and mixing it together. Don't do that. 
All right, so here's a little bit more of an example of what Tim and Moby talked about in your blood here. Now, your blood types are your genotypes. That means you're getting genes from your parents. Did you pay attention? So, for instance, if you're type A, that means you got A antigens from mom and A antigens from dad, or you got A antigens from mom, no antigens from dad. That's where the O would come in. So you only have the A antigens. They're sticking off of your blood, kind of like a party. Have that you have the A hats on. Now, here you have the A hats on. You're only you that means that your A hats are there. What type of antibodies are you producing? B, because anything that's B, that your um, antibodies are going to want to match to that so they can destroy it. So you have the B antibody. In an instance where maybe you got B antigens from mom and B antigens from dad, or B antigens from dad and none from mom, your blood type is going to be B. B. What are the antigens going to be sticking off of your blood? B. B. You're going to have the B at. What type of antibodies are you going to make? A antibodies, because your antibodies are going to be surging around for the A so you can get rid of them. Type AB. That means you got A and B. That means you have both hats on your head. So what type of antigens are you going to produce? None. No antigen. No, I'm sorry, no antibodies. You're fine. It's like, nope, I'm not, I don't need to look for anything. This is good. We're great. Type O. Do you have any antigens? No, you have no antigen sticking off of your blood. What type of antibodies are you producing? Oh, yeah. A and B. Because you're like, all of the other blood types are fine with the O. If you, don't, if you come into the party and you don't have a hat on, you're like, come on in. We'll get your hat. No problem. You'll fit right in. But if you're in the party and you have no hats and someone tries to come into your party with the hat, you're looking like, what's this weird thing? No, no, you look weird. We don't want you. All right, so blood type compatibility, speaking a little bit more on that. Type A, one second, Johnny, let me do this. This will probably answer your question. Type A is going to be compatible with what? A. Type A, a and type O, not AB, because it has that B on there, and they're like, what's that B thing you got going on? But type O has nothing, so they're like, come on in, you don't have anything? We'll help you out. Oh, you got A? You look just like us. Type B is going to be compatible with? B and O. Again, you got B hats, you look like us, you have nothing, come on in, we'll welcome you, we'll, we'll help you out here. Type A, B? A, because it has A's in their party. A, B, because we have both A, B's in our party. B, because we got that too. And O, because we're inviting, come on in, we'll help you out and make you one of us. because it has A's and it has B's. Type O, compatible with? O. Only O. You come to this party with A's and B's sticking out your head, you're going to be the weirdo, and we don't want you here. You don't match anybody like us. We don't have anything that looks like that. We've never seen that before. Got it? Okay. Information. This is some extra information for you to know. Um, the process where people receive blood through an intravenous tube would be called? A blood transfusion. In the process of a blood transfusion, um, it's done either for a surgery or a serious injury where blood is lost, or a transfusion can be for people who don't have, uh, their blood does not work properly to do the things that it needs to do, like what disease? What disease where their blood don't clot? Hemophilia, that would be one as well. So. Who can give people blood then? People with what type of blood are called universal donors? Oh, because they can give to everyone. People with what type of blood are called universal recipients, meaning they can receive. AB can receive from everybody. So that's the gist of blood types thus far. You might want to draw this little picture to give you another visual of who can give and who can get.
Now, some of you know that maybe you have type O blood, but you might have type O positive or O negative. That's an additional part of the blood, so it's a little more to this. You don't need to take notes on this, but I do need to give you this information. Daddy, hold off the question for one second, okay? Scientists studied these monkeys called research monkeys. These monkeys, they noticed on their blood, they had another protein on their blood. Um, and then they tested humans, and they saw that, oh, there are some humans that have this same type of protein on their blood. So they said, we're going to call this the rhesus factor. And if you have the rhesus factor, then you're considered to have that type of blood positive. If you don't have the rhesus factor, then you're considered to have that type of blood negative. Nothing wrong with it. You just have this additional protein. So this is another part of a blood type. It's another antigen that appears on some surfaces of blood. So we have things like A positive, B positive, OB positive, and O positive. Now, if you are positive, you can receive positive and negative. Remember, if you have it or if you don't have it, we'll welcome you in. Got it? Can't have anything extra. You either have what we have or you have nothing. We'll welcome you in. So which one is the best universal donor? Donor. O negative. Because if you're O negative, you can give to everybody. If you don't have it, then you're negative and you can only receive negative. Like A negative, B negative, AB negative, and O negative. So to have what type of blood type would not be so great? O negative, because guess who you can receive from? O negative. O negative. If you were O positive, you can get O negative and positive. Let me move on very quickly. All right. In the U.S., the most common uh, one is O positive. Why is this? I don't know. Just the way people are. The least common is um, AB negative. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing because we have O positive being the most, which means that when we have accidents, we have more people who can donate. We have accidents and there's the least amount of people that's AB negative. That's fine because we don't need you to donate. We just need to be able to donate to you. So this is a good thing. If we had more people in the world that were AB negative, that would be bad. Any questions? Okay. Then let's move on really quickly to a short video. Yes. Yeah. to play. If it's not, that's perfectly fine. You do need to study your notes for um, body response and blood type. Do you test your blood type? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. When you're a baby, do you have your blood type tested?